Good afternoon. Intimate. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, opening session of this conference titled Conditions and Projections. Uh, I want to just thank, just, I want to start by just thanking Nelson, who isn't here, but he's going to join us later. Uh, but also thank uh, Eve Blau, Hashim Sarkis, Felipe Correa, John Busquets, and Victor Sands, who is the research associate, professor of faculty, who you all know, uh, who sort of helped steer uh, this conference and uh, helped put it all together. The genesis of this conference really goes back to about a year or a year and a half ago when we celebrated the 50 years of urban design here at the Graduate School of Design. And uh, this was an amazing gathering uh, that drew a lot of attention in the press nationally too. Uh, it was what I call a potent cocktail of nostalgia and insightful criticism uh, about the role of urban design and uh, its, uh, uh, its sort of uh, effect on the construction of our built environment. Uh, and uh, this was, I think, a really an appropriate mix, this cocktail that I described for a milestone celebration. I just joined the department myself a month before the conference, and I was struck by a few things in the conference which uh, naturally made me want to instantly engage with my colleagues uh, with questions of what might be the future of the practice of urban design, and that's how we began to formulate putting together uh, this conference. And at that conference, listening to the brilliant interventions uh, and uh, you know celebrations, I could not somehow, I could not help but feel that the original spirit and mission of what urban design as an academic uh, uh, endeavor and a practice and you know, the formulation of a set of tools for this practice seem to be struggling in a sense to resist being trapped in a singular and preconceived definition and paradigm of what urban design ought to be. And I don't think the problem is the lack of intellectual investment around these questions as much as the circumstance in North America that is sort of rendering it important in this context. I do believe that the most interesting engagements around questions of urban design really are happening in the Eurozone, in Asia, South America, and potentially in Africa. I think in North America, advanced capitalism and democracy is a hellish combination for cities and for urban design. Uh, in this condition where markets really determine what ought to be done in the frenzied pace of urban development that CERT was responding and anxious about are perhaps not as relevant or immediate in this context. In fact, a large portion, portion of these cities, as you know, are facing different kind of crises and we talk about shrinking cities, but uh, it's, it's not the same frenzy that one is responding to. And I think the reality of operating in this environment has resulted in an overtly anxious condition of striving towards this definition and protecting urban design both for its market share as well as its identity. This is perhaps a trap because what results from this are boundaries or a sort of sense of containment uh, which also makes it import important as a sort of intellectual endeavor. Uh, and this is co in complete contradiction I believe to the bridge metaphor that Sert had used. Uh, urban design is a bridge practice, one that implies flows and is is, uh, is about opening, it's, it's about a practice that is plastic, that reconfigures itself depending on the problem, the agents, actors, constituencies, it has to influence. And plastic enough to even configure and reconfigure itself between built form, broader ecologies of natural systems that it's situated in. And in my understanding, this spirit has somewhat been diminished. So the intent or basic formulation of urban design uh, as being this bridging discipline, a bridging practice, uh, I think meant also it was about advocacy. It was about advocacy being integral to practice. In fact, urban design is fundamentally, I believe, at least personally, about activism, about change making, about drawing the disciplines of architecture, landscape, and planning closer together, and being the conduit for these critical feedback loops on which the survival and improvement of our cities and broader landscapes depend. Ian McCarg, Olmsted, uh, I think enriched this crossover impulse as much as Colin Rowe, Aldo Rossi, and several others who speak about form perhaps in a narrower sense, but consistently situating it in the context of the city. Furthermore, urban design, I think, should not be constrained by being situated in the urban, peri-urban, or regional. Instead, it, it has to be understood as a practice that is simultaneously engaging with all these terrains. And in fact, it's obvious that the practice of urban design is perceived to, has have, to have lost its, its potency because of its inability to embrace the regional landscape. Uh, 
Today, landscape architecture has also identified a similar crisis in its own discipline, and discussions under the rubric of landscape urbanism, for example, are attempts to resituate landscape architecture beyond its narrow site specificity. And now, at least as in the GSD here, it aspires to bring new forms of design culture and spatial thinking to the science of landscape design. At another level, these are also critiques of urban design, critiques of the fact that urban design is form-specific and condition-specific and has been shy of engaging and dealing with landscapes and geographies where a majority <coughs> of, our, of humanity dwells, a condition which is more often suburban than urban, perhaps less dependent on form and architecture as a single spectacle by which place is formed and orchestrated. And thus, through these critiques, I think urban design has clearly now become a broader field, or striving to become a broader field that includes approaches that deal with peri-urban and regional scales, including infrastructure, its relationship to places, people, etc. Similarly, through coupling with other disciplines, urban design is forming new relationships to encompass strategies for an entire gamut of conditions that are impacted by physical planning in some form, really implying a renewed reading of the condition and it's precisely this shift, I think, that will give us traction for potent interdisciplinary work. And so in speculating about the future, clearly urban design today, especially in the international arena, has evolved new hybrid forms of practice, which often result in richer versions than earlier conventional forms of practice. And in this condition, practice has transformed to become more inclusive, thereby recognizing its dependency on other actors, agencies for implementation, and the multiple domains for its design. And in, integral to this new emerging approach are dynamic incremental strategies and multifaceted feedback loops, making the process of urban design increasingly fluid. This process naturally challenges conventional notions of urban design and dissipates what I believe is the difference between developing the tools for advocacy and engaging in the act of advocacy. And <coughs> this creates new models that combine both. The tools for advocacy in the form of plans, policies, guidelines, actions, strategies are absolutely as important as the practice of advocacy itself. And sometimes these are differentiated, but today I think to be more effective, they're more often uh, than not collapsed into a single entity or process where procedures, practice, products are intrinsically sort of linked. But most critically, speculation is crucial for the advocacy agenda of urban design. And developing tools for this productive speculation is going to be one of the biggest challenges for the future of this practice. Naturally, one way of reimagining urban design for the future is through focusing on the practitioner and the education of the urban practitioner <coughs> rather than narrow defi definition-oriented education per se, which is not to say that discipline and its boundaries and integrity need to be compromised, but rather one creates the ground for the disciplines and the practitioners they produce to transgress each other's territories. These will then be urban practitioners who blur the disciplinary boundary, can work across these scales, create a new urban intelligence in addition to the prime focus on, uh, on form and preoccupation with urban scenography, questions of climate change, renewable energy systems, water management, deindustrialization, questions of justice, equity, and culture are all part of their regular repertoire. And then these bigger challenges and elusive questions will fall easily into the question of urban form, I believe, into the question of spatial organization, etc. So to train practitioners who can engage with this with, with actively in the sphere of public life, designers who have the competence and character to exercise leadership in planning and the design of cities is what I think we aspire towards. I think the critical question for education is how we can embed multiple ways of doing within the training of the urban designer, designer or practitioner, different models relevant for different conditions, problems, locations. These engage not only with different physical terrains, but also embrace, embrace the multiple disciplines and demonstrate probable imaginations of transdisciplinary practice and the fecund cross-fertilization of ideas that results from it. This approach to encompass a broader ecology in viewing the domain of urban design will equip us more substantially to respond to questions of sustainability ecology uh, and that whole sort of gamut of questions which we sometimes are not sure how to grapple with. But more importantly, it will encourage the recognition of collaboration between disciplines and the crossover which otherwise seemingly, uh, which otherwise seems uh, difficult between these disparate uh, disciplines. And I think this, this ability 
to slide um, sideways to, to also include other geographies or the ability to engage with different geographies I think is another aspiration. The global south or the majority world is, has a lot to teach us. How do we broaden these engagements to the identification of new problems, new paradigms? This new engagement with the south could also be about shore, not be about offshoring as much about using the emerging paradigms in the south as a reflective instrument for us to re-engage with the questions of urbanism in the north. The South can teach us about questions of equity, humanism in the urban context, questions that are as relevant to the North as South. These are processes by which there occurs the true construction of new knowledge. And so the sections and structure of this conference evolved with our contemplating some of these questions and some of these underpinning ideas. Uh, and with that, we decided to create these six themes collectively, the group that I identified. And these themes, which are landform, micro, urbanism, applied research, regulatory practices, strategic upgrading, issues of authorship and collaboration, we believe uh, very strongly resonate across the physical, cultural, economic, and social geographies under consideration. But more importantly, we hope that these themes will serve as an armature uh, for different and disparate concerns that all of you who have gathered here bring uh, to, to, for these concerns to collide and intersect and challenge what might be our engagement as urban designers, the role of design, uh, the potential of design, uh, the potential of the practice of urban design and what it can do uh, in defining the emerging built environments globally. And so with that, I just want to thank you all for being here, to the speakers, some of who have come a great distance to participate. Uh, we also see this very much uh, as a, a forum for us to learn, to inform our own curricular processes, which is something that's constantly in play. Uh, and so we really very much appreciate your contributing to it and for the time that you taken to do that um, in what promises to be an extraordinary exchange. Uh, very much look forward to it, and with that, I hand it over to Hashim Sarkis, who is the Aga Khan professor here, um, who does many things. You all know his work, uh, but most I just want to point out that one of the things he's doing more recently is, re is leading the charge on the, the, the research projects at the GSD, which the GSD is trying to pay much more attention on, and the research labs uh, and its formulations has been something that he's been working very hard on. So, Hashim. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You can hear me about this, right? Uh, Raul, in many ways, I see this event as an extension of the discussions we were having in your office throughout the last year. And they were very uh, engaging discussions. It was more like a mini forum where we brought our different thoughts and biases and prejudices to the table. And out of that, managed to identify different fronts or frontiers for urban design today. Starting as we are with the question of form, I have to preface this panel by saying that it almost is a form of retrenchment in it of itself, in the sense that after the introduction that you gave Raul as a way of expanding towards the different fields and reaching out to ecology, to landscape, to uh, agency questions, to political questions, that somehow I've always thought of this panel as being the moment where we retrench, where we bring all of that back home uh, to a recommitment, to a restatement of a commitment uh, to urban form as being one of the central missions of urban design. Uh, in, so in many ways I would want to situate this panel within that discussion, whether it appears at the beginning of the conference or at the end, it doesn't matter, but I would like to make that statement up front. In its 20th century iteration, I do think that the topic on the relationship between the land and the forms of settlement that occur on it, which is the topic of this first panel, could be traced all the way back to someone like Patrick Geddes and his very famous valley section. If we try a little harder, we can take this discussion back to Vitruvius. If we try even harder, we can take it back to Queen Hatshepsut in Egypt. But I, I will not go there. We will uh, stay with the 21st century, and I will try to somehow trace the genealogy of that discussion about land and form uh, back to 1999, to the publication of Kenneth Frampton's famous essay, Megaform. And the proposition that it, embod it brought with it, that architectural form still had an important role to play in the amelioration of the conditions of the megalopolis, and that formal qualities such as horizontality, scale, and groundedness could be drawn from the land and projected back onto the megalopolis through architecture. And by architecture here, 
I mean, and I think Frampton means both architectural form, landscape form, and urban form. It's a very big A. Frampton was no doubt uh, returning to form as a reaction to the systemic and performative propositions that were at the time coming to us from systems theory, from urban planning, from landscape, but also from architecture, and they continue to do so. Many explorations have since ensued on this particular theme, expanding on the different possibilities, both instrumental and aesthetic, uh, about the return to the land. Even Frampton himself, by returning and reviving the crystalline forms of uh, Bruno Taut in his Alpine architecture, was really trying to cre create a sort of prehistory of this preoccupation. But I can also mention some of the references that many of you have at your desks in the studio, people like Vincente Gaillard, uh, the mountains of, and the grottos of uh, Michael uh, Jacob, uh, some of the explorations that we're doing in the New Geographies lab on the geographic as, a, as an aesthetic, uh, but also most recently Stan Allen's synthetic book uh, and conference, The Landform Building. Yet, what have been the consequences of these propositions on the urban scale? Because as much as they may have originated with Frampton and with that discussion about the need to rectify the problems of the megalopolis through form, these explorations somehow remain untested. No wonder then that the canonical Seattle Olympic Park project of Weissman Freddy has appeared as an illustration and evidence of almost every one of these propositions. It's really the successful example that everybody returns to saying land form is possible. This is why Michael McCready is here. The reason Angelo Bucci is here is because I think in his own quiet way he has been reformulating this whole discussion about the inhabited surface of the world. By reformulating the earth as a thickened land, he describes it almost nine stories thick, and that if we, he proposes if we think and recalibrate the earth at that scale, then perhaps worlds could be traversed and sectional barriers overcome by thinking of our whole inhabited world as a land. So this is why they're here together, to open up this discussion even further. And without further ado, I would like to ask Michael to take, I, I, you'd prefer to speak from there? Uh, I think I can manipulate the slides probably from there. I, I'm happy uh, being mobile. Well, first I want to extend a great thanks to uh, Rahul uh, and uh, Hashim for the, uh, both the specific and the very um, broad uh, outline uh, about uh, urban design and uh, the importance to consider urban design, particularly in a kind of contemporary practice. Um, it's actually quite interesting that the discussion of landform, which I think would rarely uh, until recently appear in uh, an urban design discussion, is now uh, so much at the forefront. And yet, if we define landform or the reconsideration of architecture's traditional relationship to the ground, as described in the, um, uh, the, the summary to this um, a symposia, the city and landscape no longer occupy a site, but instead constructing and transforming the site itself we think about the ancient impulse to mark the land. And I think, um, interestingly enough, uh, we, I think, will be talking a little bit about history and genealogy as we project forward uh, and grapple with contemporary global practices of urban design. Um, we return to this uh, very beautiful uh, image of the Nazca lines in Peru. Um, but also, the impulse to elevate the land to iconographic status has been even more powerful. And maybe Rahul's mention of the anxiety of urban design uh, is captured in the Tower of Babel, um, a, uh, both, uh, both a powerful and, I think, um, um, apocryphal tale. Um, to trace the genealogy of this recent interest in landforms, we might look at the shared juxtaposition, or think of the shared juxtaposition, of culture and cultivation, two worlds uh, and two words that, of course, share the same root, culture and cultivation. We might also think of landforms in the context of topography or the topographic 
condition, as is in the case of one of our favorite projects, the masterpiece by Alessandro De Specchi. This could be read simply as a sort of infrastructural project getting from point A to point B, but it's so much more. It has a social and economic agenda. It also has an aesthetic agenda, which I think is important to discuss in the context of urban design. Uh, the design builds visual suspense, as many of you know, and is at the convergence of probably more vectors than imaginable. The route breaks up our headlong progress upward in a straight line with unavoidable diversions, as when the axial route splits into two channels at a landing, forcing us to move laterally. Here, topography is fully exploited and stretched to achieve a design that is complex, immersive, and a sensual essay in the choreography of movement. Similarly, landforms might be seen as infrastructural, both operationally and in terms of scale, where they become almost geographic. We've been fascinated by the incomplete megaform of the GW Bridge, the Nervi uh, bus terminal, which you see here, and uh, the Bridge Towers, which are the site of our studio uh, project here at the GSD last fall. So here is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, one could imagine a kind of uh, mega form in the context of how um, I think Hashim's thinking about this. But we also, I think, are indebted to Le Corbusier's sublime projects for Rio de Janeiro and Algiers, where the serpentine housing highway corniche registers the scale of both hill, bay, and city. Or perhaps Rudolph, where um, the kind of highway becomes a sort of inhabitable urban ridge line. Uh, we're also fascinated in lesser known examples, the Brooklyn Heights Promenade uh, in New York. And um, here, actually, uh, a relatively uh, little known firm, Clark and Rapuano, uh, did extraordinary urban design work, in our opinion. We're inspired by the BQE Promenade, where the highway is split, terraced, twisted, embedded in a bluff, and capped with a public terrace or promenade infrastructure as topography, highway as landform. Finally, we might think of landforms in the context of entrop entropy and change. And here we refer specifically to Robert Smithson, where the form of spiral jetty is only part of the story. More compelling is its entropic condition and how the piece evolves over time and under changing conditions, the salinity of the lake, the rise and fall of the water table. In other words, how it registers change. And I think in the context of landforms, there's a sort of environmental subtext that is beautifully exploited in Smithson's work. So with these thoughts, um, uh, the idea of entropy, the idea of, of topography, and the infrastructural characteristic of landforms, I'd like to share several projects that Marion Weiss and I have been working on over the last uh, decade. Uh, start with Toronto. Um, well. Um, Fragility and entropy are uh, also, uh, I think, paradoxically at stake in places of great urban density. Cities like Toronto have always had an immediate relationship to the water, and the capacity for trade and exchange has been fundamental to their existence. Now, with climate change, that exchange has taken new meaning and relevance. So our proposal for uh, the Lower Don River, which was very much uh, driven by a competition which seeked to kind of rethink the sort of armored um, domineering uh, uh, engineering um, uh, form of, uh, of uh, infrastructural work was something that was a little more plastic, a little bit more malleable. And here there's a kind of large area of development and the competition briefs sought to kind of define new ways of developing the water's edge, a rather simple brief. Now what um, I think was of great uh, interest to us was the sense that the Don River was an sort of enormous watershed, one of the largest in um, eastern Canada, uh, prone to uh, potentially very, very uh, extensive and damaging flooding. So this enormous watershed over the course probably of the last uh, 75 years was sort of slowly transformed, tamed uh, in a certain way, and um, sort of channeled in this uh, relatively uh, sharp and uh, extremely well-defined um, body of water. So there's a tremendous uh, opportunity for uh, very serious flooding. This, of course, was the kind of engineering uh, paradigm of the day which made sense. Um, but it was an opportunity to kind of uh, 
reconcile uh, the sort of agenda of uh, infrastructure, the thinking of landform, and also the possibility of reconceiving a much more supple water's edge. So we envisioned a soft infrastructure in lieu of the Don's armored edge, one that would bring together new programs with new ecologies. The design is actually driven by a kind of uh, a series of vectors, arced, arcs, and, and, and circuits that were very much uh, at the heart of a kind of hydrological study, um, which for us, and I think uh, in the context of urban design, is probably a new way of thinking through uh, urban form. So very much uh, driven by hydrological uh, studies and the sense that out of these hydrological studies there might become a kind of new paradigm. Um, similarly, what to do with the kind of artifacts uh, that surround most developed cities and now actually many, many developing cities. So uh, the thought was to kind of let the water uh, inundate, um, accommodate the inevitable flooding that would occur and kind of reframe these sort of enormous and very, very beautiful paradigms. And so in so doing, the thought was to think of landforms as a way of extending both the natural and the artificial and to bring, in this case, both city and nature into focus. A current project right now is on uh, the East River in New York, Hunters Point South, which is an opportunity to further rethink conventional open space and waterfront development and instead offer an alternative paradigm for a much more resilient, sectionally rich, and supple water's edge, sort of landform as a kind of uh, sponge. Um, this is the kind of classic uh, uh, industrial site. In this case, is a sort of almost surreal and very, very beautiful view uh, of Manhattan. Uh, this is the narrowest point on the East River. But this site, like many industrialized sites, has a rather complex and multiple history. Originally, this was uh, extremely uh, fertile um, wetlands that had been slowly developed for industry and then um, uh, somewhat uh, abandoned. Um, hard not to think of the issue of water's edge and topography and landform without kind of a, a very serious investigation of the kind of hydrological uh, conditions along the water's edge, which are now, uh, I think, part of uh, the kind of lexicon of urban thinking. But here, the thought was to uh, embrace the sort of porosity of the edge um, rather than fight it, let it become part of the kind of form making of this uh, linear urban park that is the sort of catalyst for the new development which is seen just to the, uh, in this case, uh, the east which is the upper part of this slide. Um, so we had nothing to do with the kind of development of the buildings, but rather uh, this was a kind of engine for development, important project for the Bloomberg administration. Um, and here, actually, interesting enough, urban design, I think, which as has been mentioned uh, um, uh, in Rahul's intro, uh, in North American cities is rarely a driver. And I think, happily, there are a few exceptions to, I think, the rather sad state of urban design in North American cities. But here, uh, this open space was the driver to entice developers to come to this particular site. There's also, I think, a misconception about landform is that there's a sort of rather inert uh, kind of condition, it's dirt that is maybe perhaps artfully shaped. I think any urban condition, whether it's, it's uh, in a developed or developing countries, proposes or needs to grapple with a much more complex section. Um, so in this case, you can start to see that actually the, the, the residue of those multiple histories, including toxic soil, are very much uh, driving some of the design aspirations. Also the sort of sense of trying to recover fragments of a kind of interesting topography and an industrial past. So the sense that there are multiple histories that need to be made evident. So in this case, the kind of uh, former uh, bluff uh, becomes uh, sort of framed as uh, a spectacular outlook. And similarly, in the areas that are more overtly architectural, landform is defined as something that can be shaped, sheltered, and powered. So at night, there's an opportunity to kind of uh, develop multiple, multiple modes of transportation from car to water taxi to bus to bike, um, but also to uh, co-opt the unpredictability of the water's edge into something that is uh, a more careful balance of solid and liquid. Um, in St. Louis, uh, uh, another project that we have uh, been thinking about that very much involves the water's edge um, 
we would sort of hope to kind of recover a, a number of narratives that are at play. This is a city, a kind of classic city where the water's edge, a kind of lifeblood of the city, the Mississippi, has been cut off over time by a number of interventions, including 19th century interventions. Um, and so the competition seeks to kind of reclaim the water's edge and understand a city has two sides, a water's edge has two sides, and that the kind of regaining of uh, access to the water means thinking in terms of a much larger um, uh, uh, geography, I guess, or a kind of metropolitan region. So here you can start to see the kind of condition as it is. Extensive flooding on the Mississippi, much more extensive than had been predicted in the last 20 years. Um, often the waterfront is used rather tragically for parked cars, um, hardly uh, one of the best and highest uses. I, I think our interest was to kind of reclaim the bluffs that had been leveled and to, uh, in this case, accommodate, you can start to see this sort of looks like toggle, accommodate the kind of changing fluctu fluctuations of the Mississippi that we are more and more likely to kind of register. Similarly, on the East St. Louis side, which is the kind of much poor St. Louis, uh, very few people go there, there's a sort of uh, beautiful image on the left of the, um, uh, the sort of meanderings, the oxbows of the Mississippi and their traces, and also, uh, interestingly enough, the Cahokia Indian Mounds, which at the time, probably about three, five, three to 500 years ago, were the largest Indian settlement in North America. Um, so here on the East St. Louis side, where uh, the kind of dense urban development uh, was uh, not present, there was an opportunity to kind of reintroduce a more uh, uh, plastic and fluid idea of, of a water's edge and a more recreational idea of development. And those sort of fluid geometries, those sort of hydrological studies, yielded a kind of reintroduction of the capacity for the river to flood to do so in a much more environmentally interesting way, but also to sustain uh, possible new uses and uh, new attractions. Moving to uh, a very, very different uh, continent in East Africa, and this has been an ongoing study, um, landform and artifice extend from the urban, as in St. Louis and New York, to the XXXX urban frameworks. And the lens of these frameworks takes on an altogether different reference for a greenfield site in East Africa. The task here was how to build a high-density community, a place of education, in a very fragile setting. And we don't think of uh, East Africa, but it is, in fact, uh, it's one of the most fragile um, environments uh, in the world. And you can see this identified in a kind of UN chart. Um, it's also a, a kind of environment that is incredibly dynamic, seismically dynamic, but also, as you can start to see, the kind of climatologically uh, dynamic as this image of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, registers the kind of shrinking um, uh, snow cap. Um, it's also uh, an area of incredibly different kinds of cultures and environments. On the east, uh, the traces of, of Zanzibar and the very important trading communities um, are also registered in cities that are developing Dar el Salaam very, very quickly, intense flooding. And then also, as you move west, uh, the much more fragile landscapes. Um, it's also a, a site then in a, in a country that has uh, this incredible uh, conflicted uh, legacy, uh, in this case, the colonial legacy of uh, monoculture uh, crops, uh, cop, uh, coffee, um, and uh, also overgrazing by um, Maasai and different tribes. So there's a sort of imperative to kind of either reheal the land or to think of development as very specific to this particular kind of environment. Ex-urban, but the urban problems are very, very much paramount as this area is uh, emerging. So uh, part of our study was to identify where to build, uh, not what to build, but where to build. The kind of convention is to build on the high points. Um, that's also the kind of convention, unfortunately, in many developing communities where there's a sense of needing to establish a very strong iconography. Um, often, there's also a tendency to build in the valleys where it's much easier. So our hope is to establish a series of guidelines for building in the foothills where the kind of erosion might be controlled, the kind of prospect of the horizon, and the silhouette of these beautiful hills might be maintained, 
And also, we could use the valleys for cultivation and other uses. So this shows the kind of idea of a, of a kind of urban design idea that is an inhabitable topography that's shaped to create a resilient reciprocity both between new and um, existing land. A kind of reciprocity that's driven as much by environmental forces as by economic and social forces. The last project I will talk about was a uh, project that Hashim mentioned, um, uh, our project for the Olympic Sculpture Park that some of you know. Um, but I think it's relevant to today's discussions, uh, particularly in the sense of the idea of inventing new ground, one that incorporates, in this case, building path, bridge, shoreline into a new invented topography. This is a site with a, a long and very contentious history. This is the Denny regrade, so the sort of bluff that was sort of so beautifully uh, endemic to the Seattle area had been ho literally hosed down. Um, hydrology in the service of land development, in this case, uh, Mr. Denny, who was a very uh, prosperous and powerful uh, landholder, literally hosed down the site. And uh, this is development at its most extreme, um, particularly if you were one of the unfortunate landowners who didn't sell, um, not so good. Um, so you can see these poor guys up there uh, wishing perhaps that they uh, had thought through how extreme this kind of development would occur. Um, this is uh, um, probably something that occurs far more often than we think in ways that we can't quite imagine. So the brief was really quite simple is to kind of reconnect or to think of three sites that had been bifurc bifurcated by first a highway and then, uh, well actually first a train track, then a highway, and then slowly sort of eroded and cut off from the waterfront. A rather simple uh, brief, and the brief further elaborated the fact that this should be a, um, a sculpture park. So rather than uh, covering up the existing infrastructure, we superimposed the backbone, a new Z-shaped topography, a purposely slow-speed topographic chameleon landform. This superscaled earthwork, which you can see identified in this kind of early sketch, simultaneously supports distinct micro-settings for art and ecology and diverse social agendas. So this was the, the sort of uh, site uh, as it was and the site this photograph was taken about three years ago, I think closely with, aligned with uh, 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 an exhibition that occurred here at the GST. We are actually going back, and there's an interesting uh, footnote uh, now, to uh, look at uh, how the park has been sort of holding up both uh, socially uh, and environmentally, and I'll explain this in a bit. Um, but the idea of, of creating landforms is, I think, very much uh, a question of cut and fill, um, both uh, metaphorically and literally, the kind of balance of different agendas. And you can see those agendas sort of playing out. There was a 40-foot change of grade that uh, fortunately we were able to capitalize on, 40-foot change of grade from western to the water's edge, which allowed us to kind of reclaim the topography that used to be there uh, without obliterating the multiple histories, including the very beautiful history of passing trains, which become co-opted and part of the urban experience. And again, um, landform uh, is thought of as a sort of inert effort, but I think increasingly um, the construction of landforms at an urban scale uh, takes on a kind of uh, uh, a systemic uh, um, procedure. It's also this kind of complex uh, sandwich of um, teledata lines different types of soil, different types of gravels, uh, highly compressed situations. So it's uh, hardly a kind of abstract, neutral pile of dirt. It's a highly engineered combination of artificial and natural. And also I show this slide kind of an eye test. I realize difficult to see, but uh, this was a six-year process, which I think in the history of urban design is considered relatively fast, at least in North America. So I think there uh, perhaps was uh, a little bit of, of uh, anxiety with this, but relatively quick. But I think I mention this only in the context of landform and the idea of entropy, because I think these processes have to be considered as a sort of much, much larger uh, process. 
Uh, in this case, uh, 200,000 cubic yards of earth were required. We were able to use adjacent sites. So the kind of choreography and process is something that probably is quite relevant to the idea of land form. Um, so this choreography takes on a kind of um, uh, urban scale, uh, uh, an almost military-like uh, sequence of operations, um, including the kind of precise way in which uh, the landforms are built up, and particularly in Seattle where there's a sort of very active seismic zone. We came up working with uh, uh, the engineers of uh, Magnuson Clementic with this idea of a series of large concrete plates that could sh slide and shift as uh, uh, the earth settled or in the event of a seismic uh, occurrence. And those landforms in turn play with the uh, elements that are both natural and artificial in terms of the artwork. Here you see the kind of light reflected from a piece by Teresita Fernandez. So there's always a, our, our hope is a sort of changing play of light and color. Uh, these are uh, native wild grasses. Um, but the idea of kind of deploying a sort of amalgam uh, or a kind of hybrid condition of, of architecture, landform, and engineering is evidenced in the kind of entry pavilion, which is kind of, again, the sort of primary gathering place, the sort of almost overtly architectural element. It, too, has a highly sectional ambition. You kind of enter high, the, uh, the kind of park is framed, the incredible view is framed, and then you slowly descend. So the sense of topography was very, very important to us and certainly uh, built into the kind of form making of this project. Um, here we're standing exactly over uh, a, six a six six lane highway. So the sense is the highway effectively disappears, although if you walk up to the edge, you can very much see it. Likewise, uh, the participants who are not uh, interested in the sculpture park who can't are always given a kind of sense of being uh, somewhat active in seeing and being seen. Um, similarly, the trains become active participants uh, in the sense that there's a sort of mobile sense of, of, of play in a, a series of, of landforms that are relatively static. And that sense of play is sort of uh, is captured um, over a kind of a, a cycle of the day and as we're discovering a kind of much more seasonal long-term uh, cycle. Finally, the park descends uh, to the water's edge where there's a newly rebuilt um, uh, waterfront including uh, a series of terraces for salmon. And here I think the kind of entropic condition I suppose that I talked about the sort of ability for landforms to register change is most evident. There's a six foot tidal shift and occasionally sort of the debris from a storm uh, lends this fantastic improvisational quality to the waterfront. So there's always a sort of sense of change, sense of magic, sometimes a sense of awe. And I think hard not to talk about landforms without talking about their kind of liquid counterpart. Um, and in this case, I think what we're particularly uh, proud of is uh, being able to reintroduce salmon habitat. So the sort of cycle of inhabitation includes many, many different forms of life. And one thinks of landform as a positive. I think uh, we uh, specifically sculpted the sort of subaqueous levels. So one might uh, perhaps think of landforms in reverse as well. So I'll conclude uh, the discussion, at least or how we see landforms, as one that is ongoing. Uh, this is a chameleon and potentially a hybrid project, the project of landforms. And the section or the thickness of the city has more work to do. We found great potential in remnant spaces. And with climate change and rising water levels, the topographic obligations of landforms and infrastructures offer new possibilities. Today, in the face of so many simultaneous challenges, the charge of urbanism is less a consolidating ideal, but an instrumental project with thickness and depth that intensifies, hopefully, social, cultural, and natural reciprocities. Landforms, because of their systemic potential and hybridity, liquid, solid, natural, artificial, surface, subsurface, can become new and sustainable armatures armatures that we hope invite all forms of life and all forms of play. Thank you.
Well, first of all, thank you, Raul, for this invitation. Thank you, Hashim. It's Well, it's great to be here. I, I, you are going to see I brought two very small projects to show you. But I, <coughs> I have to tell a little bit about my background. And I, it, it, this is my place. Like, uh, I, I came from this city, Sao Paulo. <coughs> it's a 20 million people city. And this picture is showing uh, the first settlement of our city, where it was found. No, <coughs> I was, of course, that uh, I like to say that maybe because I, I, I went to Sao Paulo by the first time in my life to start the architecture school. Uh, so until my 18, uh, when I was 18 years old, I was still living in my town. I moved from my town is exactly 1,000 times smaller than Sao Paulo. But the first, so this city really took a very important uh, role in my process of learning architecture. And this is uh, a guy that's very important for us in Brazil. Mario Pedros is an art critic. He played, uh, he was very important, for instance, uh, in Brasilia, because he made a, a, a very uh, well-known congress for art critics in Brasilia before the inauguration of Brasilia. So he brought Benevolo, he brought uh, Argan and several people to know Brasilia even before the construction. And <coughs> I, I, I really like when I, I saw this. I, I tried to translate myself. You can see, no, my English is not good enough. But the idea is that uh, to say that geography, for us, architect is something that is very uh, primordial and, and that we take as something that can't be avoided. No, for others, is matter of choice. So I, I, I think, <coughs> and this. It's pretty much the same place that that picture that we saw about my city. Now we can see <coughs> here is the, pl the first settlement of the city. It, it was a plateau uh, protected by a wall here. There is a, a river, this is a, a valley, and one more valley there like uh, a canyon that protect the other side of this, uh, this edge of the plateau. So this is the place where the city was found. And <coughs> the history of Sao Paulo, if I describe very fast like this, is uh, for 300 years, the city was enclosed in this first settlement. And uh, in the 19th century, the, uh, for 100 years, the, the, the city starts to face uh, this challenge uh, crossing here. So it was uh, really hard in the time uh, and I, I feel like if we had been for 100 years dreaming about uh, a kind of impossibility like to cross the void in the in the air so but if we build a bridge we can do that no like uh, magic and, and this is the bridge the first bridge that we built so in Sao Paulo we had this first primordial geography and this, that is the fundamental construction, I think, about the city that was repeat very and spread in the whole city. <coughs> so this is kind of thing that I was thinking all the time uh, during the time that I was doing uh, a first a master and a PhD at my university there in Sao Paulo. <coughs> this man <coughs> is uh, our most remarkable human geographer, Milton Santos. I gave a book by him in, in French to my friend Hashin called The Nature of the Space. And <coughs> this uh, idea, uh, I, 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 I heard him in, uh, because he was a jury in the Parliament of the Hosh, uh, uh, presentation to become uh, the highest level professor in our university in Sao Paulo. 
So when it is beautiful to me because, in a way, no, uh, all those <coughs> geographic space exist without our description. I, I like very much the idea to that, and I, I, I think that he was right in that space that didn't exist without the description by geographers. But so what we do design some space and what they do describe some space is more or less the same because we are all providing meaning to what we, the, 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 the world that we can see. So the, the, the first, the, the, the drawing, the topographic drawing of the Sao Paulo was designed by our most remarkable physical geographer. Aziz Absaber, and this is a human geographer. I think that they play a very important role for uh, architects in our place. So, since I could see the opposite, but th I could say, for instance, this is my city and this is my town, you know? or this is my city, this is my, my home, or <coughs> and this is that the same place in that valley. Of course, that I, I'm trying to be very fast because I, I would like to show those two small projects. <coughs> but I mean, in a, in a city with that scale, the first image uh, is very hard to, to rea realize where is the contour line of the city. So <coughs> if we think about to do architecture in a place like that, is is we are always trying to find uh, a reason to keep doing architecture, you know. Uh, hi. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think that some ideas is always changing, uh, like the idea of the whole is different. I think that we have to be able to build the whole through its fragments. No, uh, if I, I, I look to the title here, uh, the land and the form, I think that the, the, the idea of the landscape is much closer to environment. And the environment has no counter line as well. So uh, I think that the idea, the idea of the form in a city like we have nowadays is tend to, to the image. So I think that is more image than form is more environment than landscape. And <coughs> how we act in, in, a, in a place like that. So this is, is uh, so our, our, our way to act maybe is more by doing some operation than, you know, of course, that we are always designed, but the way that we understand and we act in these realities like this. So this is a, uh, I could say also, no, instead of uh, mega form, it could be mega meaning, like mega understanding. Uh, so I, I, I try to avoid to think about to build a huge uh, piece of construction. But the idea is to provide the, you see, core is always the same, you know, but uh, this is a kind of a very brief uh, description of conclusion about the downtown, but downtown in my place is spread through the whole city. Now, when I, 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 I thought about these four uh, operations, you know, that, that there is the city that was first built here on the top of this plateau, and then it was spread down uh, over the, the area that used to belong to the river in this place and that place. But nowadays, uh, the, the upper city was spread above the, the lower one. The lower city invaded underneath the, the upper city and everything is overlapped in a different way. But this is not, uh, although it happened, it's not so clear to be perceived. So the, the operation, the first one is to unblock uh, that former plateau to the view. It's just to view. The second one is how to transfer from the bottom to the top. 
and this I think that's a very powerful uh, operation. Uh, and, and this maybe is what Hashin uh, mentioned because uh, this is 20 meters uh, high, the difference between the lower and the top. Uh, and it's amazing, our city in 38 was a uh, one million people city, in the 70s, 20 million people city. So the density increased a lot. And so I think that one of the key possibilities that we have is to enjoy or to realize that we have in Sao Paulo very thick ground. It's about five-story ground. And so we can multiply the ground level. That is, uh, I think that is one uh, thing that's very uh, important or it's a possibility it's very uh, remarkable in this place specifically. You know? So to infiltrate and to invade are the third and fourth operation. And when I was describing the, the city like this, I spent maybe two or three years uh, with different names. You know? Instead to say to invade, I used to call that as the cave city. Instead to say to, to uh, 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 sorry, I instead to say to infiltrate the cave city, instead to say to invade the aerial city. And <coughs> once <coughs> I met a, a critic in, in Argentina, a guy called Fernando Diaz, and I, I showed uh, some house that I was uh, working, you know, project that I had done. And after the lecture, he came and he told me that he would, uh, he had appreciated a lot because the house that I had shown was half cave and half spaceship. So, and I, I had never thought about, uh, in this way, about those house that I was doing. So, and uh, of course, that that is a very sharp critic and uh, some, uh, kind of people that's so helpful in our everyday, you know. But I, <coughs> of course, that I think that there there is some or there are some links between these experience of the city and the way that we work in our everyday. You no, know, our city could be described like this. I heard from Paulo Mendes da Rocha <coughs> in '96. And I, I, I help him to find the numbers, you know, uh, that we have in, in Sao Paulo, 50 kilometers of subway to 250 of trains, 2,500 kil kilometers of lifts. But, and I add here, a, a, like a small piece of space that could be, for instance, an apartment. And it's crazy how abstract it is if we suppress everything else no, that make this possible. <coughs> so, two funny tools. But so, <coughs> I like to think about these two axes, no? And, and to me, we talk every day now about globalization, about the conurbation, about how cities are always being merged, but I think there is this direction that is looking up or down that is always uh, remind me the idea to leave our planet, you know, <laughs> is looking to the sky or to come to the planet. And, and there is this direction that is what belong to the surface of the planet. But I mean, this is uh, what the most monumental movement, maybe. And, but uh, I'm not talking about the phenomenon that we can see nowadays. But if I think about <coughs> before the beginning, you know, when we were just walking, and th it was completely spread around the whole globe. So, and <coughs> I, I, I could. Uh, translate that same direction into 
different gazes. Now, this one that I, I called, because here was a very specific situation, but I call this as the flooding gaze, and this one as the flooded gaze. No, but of course there are the same two axes. No, and 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 I I I thought about this kind of work. No, the cave and spaceship, like Fernando Diaz told me, telluric uh, to say everything that belonged to the land and tectonic, as I I telluric was a word that I heard. Uh, from Paulo Mendes da Rocha as well. And, and about operation, uh, uh, if I think about the kind of operation that we do while designing, dismantlement and inversions is, I think that are two very good ones. So this picture to say you telluric, and this picture to say you tectonic. So <coughs> these are, uh, First picture about the construction that we are doing right now. It's under construction. It's a very small project. This image is showing uh, the uh, airway approaching to Sao Paulo Airport. And it's amazing because this uh, road passed exactly over the site that we are working. You know? The site is that red point. So there are planes that go uh, come from Rio. It's about each seven minutes is crossing here in uh, 300 feet high at this point. <coughs> and <coughs> so it's like to say this is like to place pieces of landscape inside downtown Sao Paulo. No, uh, to me, this is a very special construction because so close to my office, I can walk uh, every day, take 10 minutes, and my, my experience designing building is to designing uh, things that were built very far away. So it was very hard to me to go to the construction site. And uh, I always thought that this condition to build far away made me uh, very close to the construction. And here, to me, it's a privilege because I can go there almost every day. So <coughs> this is the site. It's about 10 meters wide, 25 meters long. Uh, so the ground level is here, but the neighbors are 6 meters high uh, with no setback in both sides. So and 6 meters high, like defined by law, they can't go upper, and the, 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 it's, uh, this is a building for a couple that bought this small site to build a swimming pool and a garden. They, they live in an apartment, they want to stay, but they can't stand anymore to travel every weekend. So we don't know exactly which name we could do to this, uh, to this building. But, and they had an idea to place a swimming pool here, and they were very worried about the shade because uh, this neighbor was shading the swimming pool the whole morning that one, the whole afternoon, they had no sun. So I did, but it seems very nice, but let's, João Paulo that's here designed this with me, but and we, 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 we said, no, let's put six meters higher and we are going to be fine, the sun, the whole day and, well, this is the, ground level plan, you can see almost everything is garden. This is uh, also the reason why, for instance, we made this wall uh, inclinate like that to allow the sun goes uh, better to the ground level. We have uh, a, a floor here. It starts to be bigger, the program, a small apartment if they decide to stay. No, if they have a bottle of wine, they can't drive anymore, and so on. So it is, and, 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 uh, and, and here is the swimming pool, and like a beach here, no? It, the, the rooftop were to, to spend some time. So, model, 
building. And I think that this building is made by you know, these kind of fragments that I learned from the city. Uh, and uh, I, I can take a swimming pool as a piece of sea if I want. I can take this solarium as a piece of a beach. I can five minutes. I would prefer. Thank you. So let's go fast. <laughs> no, I'm fine. No. But <laughs> I mean, the swimming pool that there is just two columns. I you know I can't uh, describe everything, but just two columns that support everything. The swimming pool is counterweight in the solarium, and but it's it's easy when the structure engineering is. Ibsen, that's an amazing guy. So it is still under construction, but this picture show you uh, how the landscape is completely different on when we are six meters high. So when it goes six meters high upper, we are in a completely different uh, landscape. And this is the opposite, <laughs> no? It's fragment of city placed in the landscape that is this one. Very fast. Again, just three columns, two here, one there. The, 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 the floors are completely, uh, this slab, those slab and those slab are not touching any column, completely hang, but this counterweighting is almost kind, a kind of mobile almost, but not moving. <coughs> so it's a house for, uh, with a program that a little bit more, that for, for the couple will be a place to live, and for their sons uh, will be a kind of vacation house. So it is finished. The swimming pool on the top, it's very funny, the swimming pool on the top it could be in Brazil, if I say that I want to do that, it is strange. But if I say that is a water tank and we are going to swim in a water tank, it's fine, you know. <laughs> it's, <not laughs> it's quite common to have water tank on the top. <coughs> so, but I, this is what I do every day, you know, this kind of uh, small building, and but I and and the invitation to come here and to talk about landscape, urban design, I, I everything that I learned uh, came from I think my experience in the city. It's not everything that would not be uh, okay with the great master that I had, and but I I I think that. Uh, I could never design a building like this or the previous one if I were not experiencing uh, a city like Sao Paulo, you know. Uh, here, one more time, the house is completely spread in different blocks, fragments, that, that the, the kind of uh, hole that this building uh, Thus, is not the most common house. And, and I think that there is a hole that is made by the whole thing, you know. Sao Paulo, with the amount of building that we have, sometimes we can imagine that there is no meaning to design a building anymore. But it is exactly the opposite, because when we design a building in Sao Paulo and we place inside that crazy uh, sea of buildings, everything that was previous existing becomes different in a way, you know, it's a kind of a static relationship between everything. And so <laughs> limits then is something that it has a completely different uh, meaning, I think, for we all nowadays, no. But I, I was thinking about this, Hashim. Uh, environment image instead of <laughs> form and, and, and land and form. It's just, but this is all. Thank you.
Thank you, Angelo. Thank you, Michael. I would like to call order. And then, uh, perhaps as a way of warming up the audience to take part in this discussion, uh, first maybe ask each one of you to comment on the other by way of maybe suggesting a comparison or contrast between strategies. And then, uh, trying to pull in your strategies back into our discussions about urban design. Uh, Michael, you significantly kept using the term armature in order to describe the projects that you produced. Uh, and very convincingly so, in the sense that they mediated between different opposites and yet allowed for other possibilities to emerge within them. And yet these armatures were uh, also very contingent on the conditions that they were registered. And how, because sometimes we think of the term armature as being something that is neutral, external, whereas your armatures were very contingent. In that sense, if uh, Angelo was using the term telluric or te and tectonic at the same time to describe his forms, your forms recall the term that I recently learned, which is fixotropic which means a form that follows the thing underneath it, but not entirely. It's, uh, the image that was given to me was a piece of cheese on a hamburger. When you, uh, when you heat it up, it somehow takes the shape of the hamburger, but it remains identifiable as a piece of cheese. So uh, this is a compliment. <laughs> I, I like food very much. <laughs> so, uh, and Angelo, on the other side, when you start talking about environment and image, you come back to a very specific Cartesian coordinates to describe uh, the way that the forms themselves relate to the land, relate to something bigger. So while you're uh, talking about the specificity of these conditions, you zoom out very much in order to make the form itself like a plumb line. Uh, and I just want you both to elaborate on these strategies, perhaps as a preamble to the next question, which will be about these as urban design strategies, not just specific projects. May I start by yes, talking about Manfred presentation? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, uh, what is uh, amazing uh, to me, uh, you were showing those images about the Meandric River and those uh, are, uh, I was imagining that one day maybe we are going to be able to <laughs> put a piece, a stone at this size, in a position in a beach in, a, in the ocean, and we are going to build a bay. You know, if you could understand exactly how the nature uh, act, a, a very small change in the whole world. So uh, uh, we know a lot of disaster like this, you know, uh, a construction that can uh, change the, 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 the river way, or uh, is sometimes a small construction that produces a disaster. If we could control this by doing a very small intervention and to build huge landscapes and uh, I think that would be uh, so <laughs> it's what I was considering listen to your presentation yeah actually I, I, at first I I must say I would kind of uh, when you asked the question actually, I, I was trying to see how the connections uh, were <laughs> together between what uh, what I was presenting with Angelo was presenting, but I, I, th I think 
One is the issue of scale, right? With a, an extremely precise uh, intervention, uh, you can, you know, impact something uh, geographically. Um, just as, you know, conversely, uh, you know, by looking at a kind of larger systemic region, you can impact something very, very precisely. And I guess um, that's why I liked uh, the inversion of the city uh, in uh, a rather beautiful bucolic nature. I, I actually want to go to Brazil now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after I think through your uh, thixomorphic uh, analogy, um, uh, but I also uh, like the idea of this uh, very uh, acupuncture-like uh, piece in the city and capitalizing on the section because I think part of the discussion today, and this is I think maybe certainly true globally, is the, the sort of section of the landscape um, is something that is I think one of the critical aspects regardless of whether it's North America, South America, Asia, Africa. It's the one thing that seemed to kind of crop up when, at least when I look at projects that I think are grappling with uh, contemporary issues, uh, social issues, economic issues, uh, issues, aesthetic issues. So I, I think the issue of the section and perhaps the scale of the section um, seems um, very interesting in the context of both of our, our works. Uh, and I would maybe answer the question on, on armature in the sense that I think armature is probably both uh, a kind of reactive st strategy or, or opportunity or has, a, the idea of armature has a sort of uh, reactive uh, condition to it in the sense that when you think of an armature you have to kind of react to what's there but it's also proactive. You establish an armature whether it's a very small house in the city which I would suggest is uh, part of a larger armature. So there's a kind of proactive quality to it that I think is relevant to uh, the discussion of how cities or environments change, accrete, decay, uh, transform themselves. Maybe my second question, which is I think following on the notion of section that you just elucidated is that generally when we present ourselves with a sectional drawing as being the parameter through which we describe our project, and both of you tend to highlight the section, uh, there's a desire for continuity. And uh, the urban dimension is always about uh, barriers to this continuity. And urban design is always about trying to create virtue, if not actual continuities within. And how you establish those continuities is very interesting for me, but I would like to bring that closer to urban practices, because if we think about it within the confines of a project, then internally mm -hmm. continuity is achievable. But as both of you tended to suggest, that until we are able to transcend the confines of the project through section, we're not able to achieve an urban impact. And yet, in your case, they were more like uh, coordination of the, well, let's say setting up the coordinates of the project in relation to larger uh, global GPS coordinates almost. Like every project displays on its surface how it relates through these coordinates to the world. And in your case, these uh, continuities are established precisely by identifying one moment or two of discontinuity in the city in every single project mm -hmm. and uh, inscribing a figure around them. So if we cannot transcend them, we can point to them. So I, I'm raising this because I do feel that this uh, value of continuity prevails in urban design and con continues with us as being one of the necessities to think about the city. And I think maybe I can raise it to the public that when we talk about the form of the land, we are usually talking about the continuous surface, the continuity of inhabitation, and much of the critiques of the urban condition today have to do with this discontinuity problem, the barriers that infrastructure <coughs> introduces, the barriers that property introduces, uh, the barriers that also social and cultural differences introduce into the space of the city. So maybe it's a general commentary to provoke some reaction. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. But I, uh, this, uh, no, it's, uh, if I think about what is discontinuity in, in, the, in the sense as a barrier, for instance, I think that's very nice to think architecture 
as a way to overcome this barrier. You know? And of course, that uh, at the same time that we overcome one barrier, we are going to build a different one. But and this is a uh, so over as like to say overcoming uh, this continuity could be a continuous process. You know, uh, there is a. Uh, there is a, uh, sorry again, it's a Brazilian poet, but uh, he wrote a thing that to me is very nice, you know, that we should do architecture. Uh, architecture like to building doors, but nor doors not to be closed, but the doors to link uh, everything that we could. So, and, and, <laughs> One idea ab about this continuity is to think about the barrier. But there, there are maybe uh, for sure other meanings for this discontinuity. And I think that one beautiful thing about this continuity is, is uh, to understand uh, the limit uh, of uh, of what we are designing. It, and doesn't matter which scale we are working. There is always a limit, even if it is the whole planet, is a, that it, this is a limit. And, uh, and this, I think that's beautiful because it's like to, to have the proof that the meaning of uh, what we are doing uh, can't be complete in itself. So, but it, it has to resound, may I say that, in, ev in, in everything that is surrounding, existing, and so. So, <clears throat> the discontinuity, uh, it, I, I can take as a very similar idea of a fragment. So, and this idea of the whole, that is not one <laughs> single piece. And this is the, I think that is the, the idea of uh, a, a, a city nowadays, but the, of course that this is the idea of our knowledge about, you know, uh, about our language, about, you know, my limits in English is very short, but I mean, <laughs> as a language is, it's very interesting. We, we can never find the, the, the words that we want to find to say everything, you know. And this point where the, the, the word is missing is, uh, I think that this is the most interesting point to work. So I, I, I think that the, this is my, where I, I, I try to stay doing architecture is always in this border where we, where we know and we don't know, where we can and cannot do it. So, and to, to have uh, more and more clear which is the limit of what we are doing, I think that is, well, I think that uh, uh, it's very interesting as well. Yeah, yeah actually the, uh, yeah. yeah, I actually have coming back to uh, actually the idea that limits are probably good. I think in some ways, and we've all I think uh, searched for continuities, which I think uh, have been absent from the discussion. But I think the other side of the coin is that the kind of endless continuities um, are also um, need to be questioned because that too can sometimes become a uh, uh, the kind of uh, there's a political correctness to the idea of continuities that sometimes I think resistance or the kind of ability for uh, architectural or urban form to resist certain continuities is very important. And I th think maybe we're both uh, interesting, both, both Angela and myself, and, and uh, come back to this idea of the section. And I may not, uh, forgive me if I'm interpreting your work differently, but to me, the, the thing that's interesting about this section is that it introduces the issue of gravity, which is absent from the plan. So there's something anthropomorphic uh, maybe about the section. You have to think about your feet moving. And the abstraction of the plan, which is, 
I think, been overriding uh, urban design as a kind of discipline for, for a long time um, needs to reconcile the importance of the section. And maybe this also has to do with, I think you've, you've talked about this uh, quite a bit, the, uh, the section also implies the silhouette against the sky, which is, I think, a very important, uh, I think something important in your work, but I think important uh, to the discussion of urban design and urban form. So I, I think maybe I personally, uh, and I think I'm speaking for, for Marion, who is uh, very much the co-designer in these projects, we're drawn to the section for its ability to oscillate between the very precise six inches, uh, one meter, you have to understand this <coughs> palpably and physically, but also the sense that there's a kind of topography to it that is both geographic and specific. Um, uh, a, fr a friend of mine, Etienne Turpin, um, is organizing a conference next weekend at the University of Michigan called The Geologic Turn. And his interest is in um, the, the, the rise of this concept of the Anthropocene and its application in the design disciplines. How does how does the fact that humans have changed geolo geology itself, or the, the, the form and composition of the earth, relate to design disciplines? And I think one of the things that this category, land, form, raises for me that hasn't been addressed so directly is, a, is the question of a kind of materialism in urban design. So rather than thinking land, form, in terms of the shape of the land, thinking about the composition of forms, in a sense, the material composition of forms. And I'm wondering, it seemed to me that this characterization of geography as absolute and primordial was a certain, in some ways, a kind of conservative concept of geography, a sort of architect's interpretation of geography. And I wonder if, um, with the rise of new materialisms in philosophy and in science, people like uh, Bruno Latour and um, post, post Deleuzians. Um, I'm wondering if we can't, as architects and urban designers, especially urban designers who work in this kind of abstract space of guidelines and um, the regulation of form itself, um, engage materialism and the materials of urbanism more substantively. And I think that's one of the things that landscape urbanism is trying to do, and that's one of its interventions. But it didn't seem to be as active in this discussion here. One, one thing that I try to relate to the topic, if I, 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 I think about, uh, it, it's quite common nowadays to hear about topography. You know, we are talking about the decorative topography. Topo but, uh, uh, and so when I, 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 I mention about telluric and tectonic, it's like to, when we, we talk about topography and we build topography, I think that we should use a kind of construction that is more telluric than uh, what we built when we built the tectonic thing. So uh, uh, to me, sometimes it's strange that I, I, I when I, I see some project that is uh, a long speech about the, the topography, topography, and the, the construction is uh, quite regular building but so and there is no relationship between the way it is built you know? so uh, I think that's interesting to differentiate also the way that we 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 build and now if I can I would like to add the uh, answer to your question about the section please yeah? Uh, so I, I, I spent maybe four or five years doing my PhD, and that one is the only drawing that I did. No. And, I, 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 and I did work a lot. Uh, uh, and and I I knew the, why it is a section because it's not possible to represent that. In a plan, the, the, the function are completely overlapped. The operation just uh, can be showed in a, in a cross-section. If I want to show it in a very 
synthetical way. So I, th that was the design that I, 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 I had to produce, the drawing that I had to produce. And, and uh, I couldn't find so often uh, description or, or, or maps. No, in general, we represent the, the city between, by doing maps. And it is hard to represent functions overlapping. So I, I, in this case, the section were the way that I, I had to represent. Otherwise, I, I couldn't show the kind of, uh, of things that I, I was trying to find. You know? I just hope that our PhD and doctor students don't think that they can get away with one section for their PhD. <laughs> and their I actually want to come back to your question regarding the materiality issue, but also to the, 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 the very strong uh, statement about uh, architects interpreting geography as being primordial or absolute. I, in, in understanding uh, the sources, uh, particularly the work of Santos and the references to geography there, I, I do see that as a statement of a burden rather than a statement of an absolute. And I, I do feel in the return to geography today and to the literature of voluntary geography that was very uh, alive in the 60s, we are in many ways saying along with the geographers that by writing the earth, by doing geography, we are really transforming it. Uh, and yet, at the same time, architects, more than other fields, have been burdened with this responsibility towards the expression of this place or its values, etc. And uh, I do feel that that statement is an expression of that intolerable burden, if, if anything, and our desire probably to overcome it. Uh, and if we talked a bit about a value that urban design continues to hold very strongly, which is that of continuity, I would also add to that the other value which comes out of this, which is, for some reason, the necessity for the expression of something we call place. Mm. Uh, and on both fronts, I'm, I'm just adding them on the shelf of things that hopefully will come out of this conference and we can begin to unpack and maybe alleviate as burdens for ourselves. Mm. Any other questions from the audience? Please. Um. What was raised in this discussion is um, perhaps the, the link between presentations and, um, and design. The section as a presentation, the plan as presentation, etc. These are quite traditional ways of presenting things. They are static. Today we have new media which allows us to present a other kinds of information, uh, dynamic <coughs> information, related to information, related to movement, related to transforming, transformation, etc. Uh, how could you make, uh, could you relate to this kind of new media as, as tools, as aiding tools in design? Actually, that's, that's a, a, a good question. I think maybe we're burdened by a, a kind of time constraint. Um, <laughs> But I, I very much appreciate, actually, the, the, the point that as we rethink new forms or rethink old forms, um, with that comes um, the, uh, the, the reciprocity between the media and uh, the result. And I, I think um, we've been very interested in animation as a tool to talk about urban design and realize its, it's great power has less to do with describing something after the fact, but as I think all of us in the room know, I, I think it, it, the great capacity of that um, is uh, it allows us to, uh, to, to factor in time in our designs in a much more um, immediate way. So perhaps it was, at least maybe in, in my case, just the judgment of 20 minutes, you could only uh, show <laughs> so many animations and just chose not to, but I think that uh, the ability to simulate and animate uh, how uh, processes work and, and actually uh, material conditions, uh, to uh, go back to the, the previous question, is a, a relatively new uh, phenomenon that I, I don't think we have as a discipline have explored quite effectively. 
I, I am very interested in, in this notion of the medium itself in relation to the practice that we take on. And as you insinuate in your comments, urban design has been criticized for having relied too heavily both on the representational instruments and the forms of architecture in, uh, in, its, uh, in its recent history. And uh, as you do indicate, uh, there are other media that have invaded uh, our understanding of uh, space. Uh, both in terms of representation of uh, special practices, forms of inhabitation, but also flows of information, etc. And uh, I, I do want to add that even though we're still drawing sections, and we have to, uh, because we have to, <laughs> and even though we're drawing plans, uh, somehow the means by which we draw them have changed, and they have benefited a lot from the dynamic processes that you yourself mm -hmm. described in order for us to be able to acquire or extract from them very different qualities. For example, the whole discussion about the section as silhouette uh, is only possible because we are able to extrapolate from forms an intensity of their boundary and edge. Uh, in the same way that the section as contour, which comes out of uh, parametric thinking through plan, uh, implies very different techniques of both composition but also of thinking through the forms themselves. And uh, in, in that sense, I think there's a way in which those static media that you're describing do tend to absorb uh, the seemingly more dynamic uh, information systems and enter into our thinking and introduce very different values, which I, I do not think, for example, that the forms that they're describing would be possible without the media that you've, uh, you've listed. I like your term, thinking, because when we talk about the media, digital media and computation, etc., it usually uh, associated with uh, analyt analytical model and, and research, all kinds of uh, abstract model, etc. But here, um, emphasizing the representation as a, as a tool for thinking, um, I think that's it really, really was um, very interesting in talks of, of, of both of you. Maybe one more question? Sorry, one more no, answer and then yeah, one more yeah. question. No, I, I tend to assume that as much uh, way we have to look to what we are studying is, is, is good, no, is bad. But uh, if I take specifically the section that I showed about the city, so uh, it, is, it was important to keep it as a sketch. So if I start to develop, develop the, the representation, I had at the same time to develop the, the idea. So, and, and I was trying to keep that as uh, like one step before a project. You know, one step before to the start to design the buildings. Uh, and, and this was very strategical in that case. So the, the, uh, otherwise, uh, the result would be very uh, specific and much more uh, uh, full of information and uh, relate to a specific time. So, because a project, I think that in general, no, is a, is a, uh, an answer for very specific condition, very specific context. And, and if I could kept that, those as a sketch, the information was much more open. You know, and, and maybe in that specific case, this is a reason. And we always think that each way to represent what we are doing uh, has a, uh, it requires some specific information. So if, this is very trick, I think. In, can we have one more question? No? Eve, <coughs> please. I just wonder what um, you think is the, we, we talk a lot about urban form, and what is the sort of usefulness of thinking about urban form in terms of land form? Um, and how does that, since we're talking about ways of thinking, how does that sort of um, change our ways of thinking about urban form? Uh, maybe 
back to the question of materiality, but also the question of representation and technique, I think both of you uh, tended to extract certain operations out of the description of the landform in order to describe verb and form. So they apply almost the same <coughs> level of abstraction to both in order to bring them to each other. And I think the telluric or the pixotropic, if I can apply that, those morphologies become useful in the description of the urban form itself. But uh, I, I do also think that, again, coming back to the question of materiality, that uh, for long we have understood the role of the urban as being a way of neutralizing the land. That uh, either we expel it or we uh, neutralize it as much as possible. And I feel that what is what we're seeing at both scales, if I can talk about them at scales, is a way that the land can lend some of its attributes that we have for long suppressed as ways to heal some of the problems that the megalopolis has burdened itself with through this process of neutralization. So somehow it's a remedy with an antidote, uh, which is the land. These are at least a couple of ways where I see a response to your question, but uh, I think we put it on the shelf as well for the next discussion. Do we have a time for a break or we move to the next panel? We take a five minute. Five minute break. Thank you very much. Thank you.